Welcome to the sayings of Jesus. In today's message, The Finger of God, Dr. McLuhan teaches why Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Last week, a man wrote to me from another faith who wanted to have a conversation with me about his religion and mine. We engaged in a longer conversation than usual. And in the process of that conversation and the questions that he asked me, I shared some stories of people who have been healed in the course of this ministry. I shared the story of Mama Jacinta, who got up out of that wheelchair and has uh, not gone back to it. What a joyous story. I'm still in touch with Mama Jacinta. She writes to me. And I shared that story with him. And this was his response. He wrote back and said to me, that was done by the power of Satan. Now, I immediately gave praise to God. I know it seems strange to you. I gave praise to God because that is exactly what the religious leaders said to Jesus after he performed one of his absolutely impossible miracles from a human standpoint. In today's message, The Finger of God, we'll hear what Jesus said to those religious leaders. Both Matthew and Luke wrote about a man who was brought to Jesus when he visited a synagogue by his friends who everybody else had given up on him. This man was brought to Jesus. Matthew says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute, was brought to him, Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. Can you imagine being both blind and mute? You can hear, but you can't speak. Of course, you hear strangely if you're not accustomed to hearing your own voice speak. That was the man's condition. Luke gives us more details about it from a medical standpoint. Luke says that he was casting a demon that was mute, And so Luke gives us an understanding that the disease was not as much physical as it was driven by a demonic influence. His his blindness may not have had a demonic component, but in Luke's understanding, the man's muteness was driven by an evil spirit. Dr. Luke makes this clear, that he was unable to speak because the spirit had come upon him and it was present in the man at the time. Now, this is important to the story because it was well known in those days that rabbis or exorcists of the day could not do anything unless the man could speak and say the spirit's name or say something about what that spirit was doing to him. If the spirit could not speak or if the man could not speak, the spirit had him tied up forever. There was no hope of him being able to get free. Uh, There was no hope in his community. His religious community couldn't help him. The medical community couldn't help him. His family and synagogue community could not help him. And Jesus visited that synagogue on that day because he knew that man would be there. And Jesus is here today looking for people who can't be helped by anyone else except Jesus. He's visiting in the homes of people who are watching this message to offer hope that nobody else can offer to you. And through this message, we offer you the power and the hope of Jesus to come into your life and to touch what doctors have been able to do. Matthew says, Jesus healed him, and so the man spoke and saw. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. What a remarkable statement. Wouldn't you like to have been there and see the expression on this man's face? As his eyes opened and he saw, he was looking into the Messiah. He was looking into the eyes of Jesus. He didn't even know what it looked like in that synagogue. He was seeing the faces of the religious leaders who were not happy, the faces of his friends who are extraordinarily happy. He may have seen a wife. He may have seen children. He may have seen parents. He may have seen grandparents for the very first time because his eyes were open and he could say whatever he wanted to say. He didn't need speech therapy because Jesus helped him to speak clearly and plainly. When Jesus touches you, it's such a great thing. Luke reported that when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. I certainly would love to have been in a meeting like that where something like that happened and you see the marvel that just comes across the audience and it is just astounding to you to hear the applause 
and yet to look around and to see. Remember in the synagogue, you sat around in a circle. There were not a circle, but a, the open end of a, of a triangle, of, of, a, of a rectangle. And then you could see the leaders that were looking and scowling and looking very unhappy at what had just happened. And so while the people marveled, the leaders, the religious leaders, were furious. Once again, Jesus had demonstrated their lack of power to help people uh, who needed to be healed or who were possessed by an evil spirit. The reaction was clear and swift. Some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Luke chapter 15, 11 and verse 15. And of course, that's exactly what the gentleman in who, with whom I was having a conversation said to me, Beelzebul, is another name for Satan. This accusation was made against Jesus many times, not just one time. And Jesus was ready to give another one of his powerful sayings to undo what had just been said. Every kingdom divided against itself, Jesus said, is laid waste. A divided household falls. And if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Luke chapter 11, verse 17 and 18. Uh, Jesus continued by saying, If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judge. They will judge uh, these older men who are saying, that this is not possible. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The leaders were referring to the kingdom of Satan, but Jesus was referring to the kingdom of God. And on that day, the kingdom of Satan was invaded by the kingdom of God with the presence and power manifestation of the Holy Spirit flowing through Jesus' life. The kingdom of God does not need armies or weapons. The kingdom of God is in the power of our hands. Jesus said, it is in the fingertip. What a wonderful expression that is. Some of you may have seen this wonderful depiction by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel uh, in Rome depicting the creation of Adam, just this whole idea. It's a theme in the Bible that takes a little while to find, but it's there when you look. It is by the power of God's finger that all, all things happen. Sometimes we say it is his spoken word, and indeed it is a spoken word, but it's as though it was just on the tip of his finger without any effort God was able to create all that is. The finger, the finger of God becomes a metaphor for the power of God. And we see this flowing all through Scripture. Now, Pharaoh's musicians in Egypt uh, understood what the religious leaders in the day of Jesus did not understand. When Pharaoh asked his magicians why they could not keep up with the miracles of Moses, remember they could only duplicate the first three, and after that they did not have no ability to continue, they said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And so Pharaoh understood that the finger of God, the God of Moses, was more powerful than his finger. He could point, but he could not do what God does, or he could not do what Moses did. And so ask God to soften your heart today, to understand the saying of Jesus, that the finger of God, the power of God, the representation of the power of God is in our hands. It's very clear in the story of Moses when Moses was first on the mountain back in uh, Saudi Arabia on Mount Sinai. This is one of the things that God said to him. When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all the miracles I've put in the power of your hands. Isn't that a lovely scripture? I've shared with this with so many people. It's found in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 24. I often ask people, just look in your hands and ask this question. What miracles have been put in my hands? They've been assigned to me. 
that by the power of God to flow through these hands. And so when Moses stood before God on Mount Sinai the second time, after seeing the power of God and after bringing them all out, and there they were wandering around in the Sinai, uh, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And you, we read this in Exodus when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai. He gave him two tablets of testimony, as we know the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone inscribed by what? The finger of God. And so the finger of God was protection for the children of Israel in Egypt, but the finger of God is power to command, power to write a law that is life-giving, that orients society in a way, that regulates society in a way that is pleasing to God. Then when King uh, Belshazzar disrespected the Lord in Babylon, they had had a skirmish out. Nobody had won that fight, but the king wanted to boost the morale and he called for the golden goblets from the temple to be brought for his soldiers and for his lords to have a great feast. And they were drinking out of these golden goblets that were used in the sacrificial system during the temple days. And with that disrespect, God could hold back his finger no longer. And from his presence, there was a hand sent and it was writing was inscribed and this is the writing that was inscribed, Mina, Mina, Tikal, Eupharsin, simply meaning your, your, your life has been weighed in the balance and found wanting this hand of God. Uh, several years ago, I was in the Berlin Museum, the Pergamum, where so many artifacts from Babylon have been brought. And many believe in that one of those walls was a part of that palace where the handwriting on the wall took place. You can go and see it today. And so it's the power of God in his word. It's the power of God to judge. And he judged that nation because they did not trust in him. And then there's the power to forgive. It's in the hand of God. You remember when they brought to Jesus the lady who, had, uh, who they wanted to see stoned. And what did Jesus do? He, he bent down and he wrote with his finger, on the ground. You see, Jesus was identifying himself with the hand of God and with the power of God. And it's the power to forgive. And so then after it was over, he just said to the lady, where are those who will judge you? And he said, there is no, no one left to judge me. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. From now on, go and sin no more. It is the power to be forgiven is in the hands of Jesus. And so the finger of God has power to protect. It has power to command, give us the word of God, power to judge, and power to forgive. Aren't you so glad the finger of God brings the presence of God? And it's here in the house today and in this message and in this broadcast. These sayings of Jesus are powerful. Here, your pastor, there's no stories like this in the Quran. Muslims are told to defeat Satan. The Quran mentions Satan over 40 times, but there is no teaching on how to overcome Satan other than with a sword. A spiritual enemy cannot be defeated with a physical weapon. We are not in a physical battle. We are in a spiritual battle. We need the finger of God. We need the power of God in our life. Luke says, after Jesus cast the demon out of the man and healed his mouth and his eyes, the people brought the man to Jesus. They asked the right question. This is the question that the people asked. All the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? Matthew chapter 12 and verse 23. What a great question that is. Their eyes were opened to see that Jesus is the promised one, the books, the before books, the Old Testament books, especially the prophet Isaiah spoke about. Uh, the prophet Isaiah said so much about Messiah. And Matthew went on to quote this important passage from the prophet. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved the one whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to who? The Gentiles. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. And that's the message of today, hope for people around the world. 
Don't let anybody tell you Jesus just came for the Jews. He just came for Israel. I hear that all the time. The prophet said Jesus was coming for everyone. His first mission was with the Jewish people, but his larger mission was with all people, about every single person around the world. Jesus came not only for Israel. He came for every single person who has ever lived. Jesus always brings hope. This is the reason. We are grateful that Jesus is still the hope of the world, no matter what we are facing. Jesus is present right now, offering hope to you and to me, whatever we are facing. Here are some stories of people who've experienced the hope that Jesus offers. How many of you remember our dear Barbara Stallings when she first came, you had so much difficulty speaking and just gently she was loved and God freed her tongue. We love you so much, Miss Barbara. God has done so much for you. We're so glad that we can talk with you and you can talk with us and we can know more about the love of God in your life. Pastor Margaret had a student who had selective mutism. This young girl would speak with her mother but with no one else. She would come and sit at this piano, I believe, and take some lessons. And slowly but surely, Margaret would just love her from week to week. And one day she opened her mouth and began to speak. She, Margaret earned her trust, Pastor Margaret. Yeah, isn't that a beautiful story? And here's a story, not necessarily connected with a demonic influence, but some other influence caused this girl to not be able to use her tongue. We just are so thankful that God knows how to love us and bring us through whatever we're struggling with and to touch us. I've shared the story many times. My father was unable to speak without stuttering. And when he mentioned to people, even his family, that God was calling him to preach, people said, how can you do that in Bible school? They never invited him to speak in the preaching class. But he knew that he was called to preach, and whether he could speak or couldn't speak, he got on a boat and went uh, 30 days at sea until he reached Cape Town. And when he landed in Cape Town, God began to free his tongue. And the joy of his life is when he came back and retired, spoke on a radio station, heard on seven states, the Billy Graham station, affiliate station in Black, Bur in Black, uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina, the man who couldn't speak, preached on the radio. Now these stories are close to today's story, but I want to bring you to a story that is today's story. You and I have been blessed to have Apostle Rudolf Reiser speak in this church on a number of occasions. He's come twice and prayed over people, and he and I are still in touch, and we talk about stories. And I asked him one time about this particular story in the Bible, and he said twice, that God had used him to touch somebody who was deaf and mute. And these, both of these young children, their ears were opened and their mouth was freed and they were able to speak. Who wants to be able to do something like that? <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We've been touched by Apostle Rise's ministry. We continue to be in touch with him. He's been an encouragement to us to go deeper in the Lord. And so we, we encourage you today to go deeper in the Lord. Who would like to partner with Jesus in healing people who are mute, deaf, or blind? Those are the big three, aren't they? And so we want to partner with God. This is what Jesus said as the story continued. Whoever is not with me is against me, but whoever does not gather with me scatters. And Jesus is inviting us to be with him and to gather with him. And he was clearly saying to the friends of the man, you're with me, and you receive this blessing. And he was saying to the religious leaders, you have your theology that doesn't work. You can experience your theology, or you can have your theology, but you're not with me, and these miracles are not going to flow through your life. Jesus has opened your eyes to see that the power of Jesus, that Jesus has power to protect he has power to heal and power to forgive. We invite you to receive Jesus as your Savior. Before I go any further, just let me say, if you're blind, I speak to your eyes today. Be opened right now in Jesus' name. If your ears are stopped, be open right now in Jesus' name. If you have trouble speaking, I loose your tongue 
right now in Jesus' name. I command any evil spirits who are associated with these tormenting conditions that you are facing to come out of you right now by the finger of God and the power of God flowing through your life. Come, Holy Spirit, fill and heal people who are praying with us right now. Ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins and to make you his child. If you just prayed with me, write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. If you are healed, let me know what God has done for you. Next week, we'll continue studying the sayings of Jesus. Father, thank you for your great love and power. Fill us with your spirit and help us to carry your blessings of spiritual and physical healing to others this week. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.